I had the absolute pleasure today of interviewing one of my heroes, one of my mentors, Dr. Pam Popper. She's a naturopath, an internationally recognized expert on nutrition, medicine, health. You probably know her from the movies Forks Over Knives, Food Choices, Processed People, Making a Killing. She's the executive director of the Wellness Forum Health in Columbus, Ohio that offers educational programs and I have to put a plug in for your woman's course because wow I learned so much from that. You offer lifestyle interventions, healthcare services and let's not forget the magic of Chef Dell in your kitchen over there. That's unbelievable. And Dr. Popper is also a lobbyist, a public policy expert. She continually works towards changing laws that interfere with patients rights to choose their health provider and method of care. She serves on the Physician's Steering Committee, the President's Board for the Physician's Committee for Responsible Medicine. She's been involved in the Sacramento Food Bank Project. She's taught for Dr. T. Colin Campbell, the teaching team at E. Cornell, with that course, the plant-based nutrition. That's amazing. And of course, her most recent book, Food Over Medicine, The Conversation That Can Save Your Life. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I love the question and answer format. That was amazing. And I know that anybody who's interested in health needs to hear you speak because like, their life could depend upon it. So thank you so much for taking time to speak with me today out of what I know is a very busy day for you. Well, thank you for having me. These are important issues we're going to talk about today and more people need to know all about them. So this is, this is exactly the right thing to spend time on. Absolutely. Thank you. So I'm doing my bit. You do it in Columbus. I'm trying on Facebook to offer 10-day challenges to people. And we have two different types of groups in my Facebook group. People like myself, I've been plant-based for a while, but I'm still on a journey. I still have some weight to lose. So we're doing the 10-day um, challenge using Dr. McDougall's Maximum Weight Loss. And so we've got two groups of people, one who's been plant-based, the other group is kind of new to this way of life. So what advice can you give us to help us mentally prepare you know, emotionally, physically, what can we do? Well, you know, interestingly enough, dietary change is um, is very much like anything else that you decide to change in your life. It starts with you have to make a decision, you know. And, and so what people do sometimes is they use these words like, I'm going to try this. Um, I'm going to see what I think. You know, what, what it really is is I'm going to dip my toe in the water instead of just diving into the pool. Mm -hmm. I'll act like I'm swimming and tell people I'm swimming, but I'm really not going to swim. You know what I mean? So I, I think the first thing is that if you want to get something out of this, if you're one of the people listening to this or watching this and you're saying, I have high blood pressure, I'm a type 2 diabetic, I have weight to lose, um, I have acne, I'm tired. I mean, you know, the list of things that mm -hmm. play people never right. ending. Right. And, and you want to change that, you have to make up your mind to, to change things and, and to do it in substantial ways. You know, you're not going to solve these types of problems by eating a little bit more blueberries today and eating a little bit less potato chips tomorrow. So, you know, the decision that you're going to do this and then putting into action all the things that people are going to learn from you to do. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think the actual mental part of this is a big deal where you decide you know, I used to be a sales trainer. I'll just back up and tell you this. And I would teach people how to start their own business and sell products. And the biggest problem that people had was that they were they just weren't committed to doing it. And so you never succeed at anything if you're not committed to doing it. Um, the second thing I would do is to, is to again, dealing with the mental issue, look at this as going to be a way of life. It's not going to be just a temporary thing. This is just the get started part. And then you live the rest of your life in a way that, allows you to be healthy for the rest of your life. And I can speak to that. I'm 60 years old. My friends who are 60 years old, they're taking medications, they're having surgeries, they're overweight, they don't feel good, they're tired, tired all the time. I don't want to go there. So having done this for a long time now, I don't have to deal with those kinds of things. So that's my best advice. And then just do it. You know, just do it. Just eat the food. People, And, and it doesn't have to be exotic. This is something I've been telling people lately is that uh, some folks are used to a pretty limited diet. And they go, oh, gosh, I can't do this because I don't like kale and black lentils. Well, then don't eat kale and black lentils. If you like green beans, corn, 
potatoes and bananas, then you should eat green beans, corn, potatoes, and bananas. And then later on, you can try some things and get adventurous. But um, I think people put up a lot of barriers in their mind to doing this that really don't have to be barriers if you think about it a little bit differently. Right. Thank you. And you do look amazing for someone who is 60. Uh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're right. And I know, and I'm coming up on that myself, and I see people a lot who are dealing with all these health issues and it's like if you just change what you're doing change the food you can change your health well and sometimes people think that's so simplistic how can it actually be that just right. changing the food change but but let's think about it a little bit differently you know the average person will put a few pounds a day of food in their body all right so now let's just let's just say five pounds i probably eat more than that but let's just go with five that means in a given year you're putting a couple thousand pounds of food in your body 10 years twenty thousand pounds of food wow. 20 years 30 years okay so how could you possibly put tons literally it's what it adds up to right. of something in your body and it wouldn't impact your health i mean it, it just defies logical thought that that could be the case so so we've been trained to think that high cholesterol is a crestor deficiency mm. it's not high right. cholesterol hypertension type 2 diabetes these are food born illnesses we eat our way into them right. and the only legitimate way to address them when i say legitimate as in it works you can actually do something about this production you have to eat your way out and so um, when you start thinking about it that way, this becomes really, really exciting. Uh, at least I never get tired of or lose excitement for it because look at how many sick people there are and think about what our country would be like if all the sick people, or most of them, could didn't have to be sick anymore, right? Well, and we wouldn't have the, the cost. I mean, oh, yeah. talk about the Our cost taxes would go down. Up. How's that for an incentive? We're oh, coming yeah. up on tax season. Sooner or later, in the next few weeks, we're all going to have to file a tax return and pay a lot of us. Right. So this would be a big incentive. How would you like to help everybody in the country lower their cost of health care, and then we all pay less taxes? I'm for that. Me too. You have a diet, a course on uh, diet and lifestyle interventions. What mm -hmm. Can you give us an overview of this class, and who is this for? Is this for somebody who is just starting new... Is it a refresher? Well, um, I'll back up. We own a school called the Wellness Farm Institute, and we're, we're a government-sponsored or government-approved institution of higher learning. So we think one of the reasons or one of the things we have to do to um, fix things, if you will, in this country is we have to change the way that healthcare professionals are educated. Well, we have to start with the few million of them that are already educated. They have to learn new things. And so uh, the Diet and Lifestyle Intervention course, um, anybody can take it, but it was designed for doctors, nurses, dietitians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, physical therapists, I mean, anybody who is involved in delivering healthcare um, who wants to learn a new model of healthcare where um, it's evidence-based, collaborative with the patient, uh, and involves diet and lifestyle change as a primary intervention tool. Notice I said primary, not the only. Uh, there are other things that you have to do too, but what we do is uh, over the course of uh, 15, it's a 39 hour course, over the course of 15 classes, we cover things like how to read the science, we cover um, cancer and autoimmune diseases and gastrointestinal diseases and women's health, children's health, men's health, mental health, musculoskeletal conditions, uh, vaccinations, and all these things that require a fresh look um, and a new approach. And um, the person who takes this course ends, they, they all say the same thing at the end. My life is forever changed. I, I will never be the same again. I, I will take care of myself differently, and my relationship with the patients or clients I'm helping will be entirely different based on the material learned. So it's live and interactive. It's not an online course. It's live and interactive. And the summer session, which is coming up, we offer the celebrity lineup. So it's taught by Dr. Barnard, Dr. Uh, Esselstyn, Dr. Goldhammer. I mean, some of the people who folks really want to learn from firsthand. And uh, so that's what it is. And then we have some people who take it who are lay people, and they just want to learn from these people. You know, it's, it, I, I want to say something, too. You probably have heard this before, where the common thing that health professionals talk about is, Oh, people don't want to have all this detail about health. They just want to be told what to do, and they're not interested in science. And I have not found that to be true at all. I mean, our members here 
they can't get enough of this stuff. I mean, it's just like I was. Uh, how I ended up in this profession is I was just a person changing my diet years ago, and then I just got so interested in this, look where I ended up. So um, we have a lot of lay people who take this. They, they just can't wait to learn more about how to keep themselves healthy and, and, uh, you know, and, 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 the, and how they can help other people by giving sound advice to them and that sort of thing. So anyway, it's a fine course. I look forward to teaching it. And um, we offer it three times a year. And we've been doing it since 2009, believe it or not. So we've educated a few hundred health professionals. What do you find most health professionals know about this way of eating or what this, the power of this? It's even worse than that. They not they don't know know much about nutrition at all, and what makes it even worse, and, and this is why we have to we have to talk about how to read the medical literature and that sort of thing, is that doctors really aren't taught to read the medical literature and do research either. Uh, we like to think that they are, but but they very often quote what they're told by drug reps and, and drug reps materials and that sort of thing. Um, and and so they don't dig deep. So so we get. I mean, people will email me sometimes after these classes and say, "I had no idea that prescribing this drug reduced the risk of a heart attack by one point two percent." I mean, did, I don't know if you know that, but Crestor, really well advertised drug on television, for lowering cholesterol, it reduces your risk of a heart attack, stroke, or death by one point two percent. And I think most people taking it and most people prescribing it had no idea. Well, if you don't know, if you're not reading the medical literature and you're not really very good at interpreting it, you're just telling people what the maker of Crestor told you. I think it's AstraZeneca. Take Crestor, it lowers your cholesterol. It does that, by the way. It just doesn't change your health outcomes very much. So um, this really, this whole course is really taking a step back and saying, what is it we're trying to do here? What it is that we're trying to do is we're trying to change long-term health outcomes. We're not trying to have pretty blood work and nice biomarkers. I mean, it's good to have low blood pressure. It's really good to have great blood work. But if you don't change the, the end game, you're not living longer, you're not living better, you're not less medicated, what are we doing? Right. Yeah, so, so that's where we start this whole process. Is let's back up and let's, let's change the end goal. Let's set our sights a little bit higher. Let's not manage type 2 diabetes. Let's try and get people to reverse their type 2 diabetes. Absolutely. Um, let's not, you know, let's take an autoimmune patient and see if we can avoid chemotherapy drugs instead of just, you know, wait till they can't take those anymore and feed them biologics. So, anyway, I could go on and on, but, but the idea <laughs> has got to be. I mean, just right. think about it if we applied the same principles of healthcare to another field. Think about this. You, you take your car to a brake shop. And say the brakes aren't working very well, and the car squeals when I try to stop it. And you leave the car for a day and a half, and you come pick it up, and you still the brakes don't work, and the car squeals. But you paid anyway. And then it gets worse. Now you're hitting trees and phone poles. So you bring the car back, and, and at some point in time you say to this guy, "Can't you, gal? Can't you fix the brakes?" They say, "Oh, we don't fix brakes here." Okay, so if you keep bringing it in. You won't hit the trees and phone poles going so fast, and you may not plow down your mailbox on the way home. That's the best we can do. That's what we're doing in healthcare. We're, we're just basically, we're not repairing anything. I mean, the human beings, I don't want to compare them to machines because they're far more complex and the human body is a much more beautiful thing, but, but the reality is that whether you're taking your body to a physician because you have sickness mm-hmm. or you're taking your car to the repair shop because it needs to have parts replaced, the outcome is supposed to be fix it. Okay, that's right. the expectation. Right. We don't fix anything in medicine, in traditional medicine. So, if somebody's starting this way of life, plant-based eating, what are the benefits? What changes could they expect to see in their body? Well, I think the first thing is that I've always likened dietary change to, uh, and, and some other things related to it, that you stop picking at the sore. All right. Mm. So this is the way I explain. People will say to me, "What's going to happen? Am I going to get better? Will I feel better? Am I going to be cured?" And, and people who make promises about this kind of thing, I think, are a little bit irresponsible because everybody's a little bit different. Everybody has a little bit different history. But but here's how I explain it. Let's say that you came into my office today, and I had a big gash on my arm, huge. It, it looks raw and nasty, and I'm picking at it, and and I keep complaining that it won't heal. And at some point in time, you tell me, you know, Pam, if you would stop picking at that sore, I'm pretty sure by the time I leave the office, it would be better. And I t- and then I come with, uh, to you with the question is, well, 
how fast will it get better? Will it heal? Do you think I'll have a scar? Should I go get stitches? I mean, and, and you can't possibly answer those, those right. questions. You don't know how right. long I've been picking up sore. You don't know what my medical history is. If I'm a type 2 diabetic, that might take longer to heal. But here's what we can say. If you stop picking at the sore, you are going to get better, okay? So when you look at the dietary patterns of people, they eat a lot of animal food, they eat dairy, they eat a lot of fat, they eat a lot of processed food, they don't drink enough water, they drink too much alcohol because they think red wine fries you health and all that. But see, you package all this up, and what people are doing is the equivalent of picking out the sore. And so the first thing we tell people is you stop picking at the sore and things are going to get better. All right? So that, that, that way we can explain this without making promises you shouldn't keep. Having said that, you read my book, Food Over Medicine, which included some of my own patient stories. And, and what happens is, because food is the cause, as I was saying earlier, foodborne illnesses, it's because food is the cause of so many things that go wrong. Um, when you stop picking up the sore and eating the right food, the body starts to heal itself. And so we often see weight loss. You know, I used to be overweight. I'm not anymore. Um, people have lower blood pressure. They have uh, uh, diabetes starts to go away. In fact, the changes can be so rapid that we caution everybody, you should be in contact with your doctor as you're doing this so you don't end up comatose on the bathroom floor because you're over-medicated now that your blood pressure might be dropping. So, so um, those are the kinds of things that happen. Acne goes away. Your hair stops falling out, you know, and, and the energy level increases because you're feeding your body the right food. You know, the way that we feed ourselves, it would be like if I took my car to the gas station and put half Coca-Cola and half gasoline in it and complained that it didn't operate so well. Well, that's sort of what we're doing with our bodies. So you put the right fuel in, and just like the car runs really well, so does the body run really, really well. And um, a lot of stuff goes away. And, of course, you know, you can get online and read all kinds of testimonials from people who say, I did this and it worked. And then you can also read well-designed published studies like the report what Dr. Esselstyn said with his cardiac patients and Neil Barnard's stuff diabetics showing that um, uh, you know, following people you see that their diseases resolve and they stay well over long periods of time and that's pretty exciting too. That is amazing and I think you touched a little bit about my next question already is should people tell their doctors about this? Yeah, they should. Uh, the way that we handle this here is that you don't really want to ask for permission as much as say, I've made a decision to do this. And mm -hmm. um, what I'm going to need is for you to monitor me. And this is particularly important if you're taking blood pressure meds or drugs for diabetes, because as those numbers start to normalize, like I said, you can end up comatose on the bathroom floor and that's not where you want to be. Um, same thing which would be true with autoimmune patients. If you take a steroid drug, you have to dose off of that. You can't just stop taking these drugs. Um, sometimes doctors don't know much about this, so the best thing to do is bring information. We send people from here to their doctors armed with articles that, um, that uh, are good to show the doc so that the doc understands what's going on better. And I will say this, this is a very encouraging thing. Um, you know, I'm very critical of the health of medical professionals. I'm not afraid to be critical of anything. No. But, so, no. That's right. but what I have seen over, because I've been doing this for 21 years, is that in the last five or six years, there's been a real sea change out there. And um, doctors don't always understand this, but some of them will say, listen, I don't want you taking any more drugs than you have to. I'd be happy to work with you on this. Um, they often are curious. Um, one uh, member we had here went to a doctor, and, and, um, and, and the doctor said, nobody ever wants to talk to me about anything. This is great. Come into my office. And, you know, a lot of doctors would like to practice in a much more collaborative way, but the patients have been trained to just come in and you know, pick up their prescription and, and walk out. So uh, I wouldn't be too worried about hostile doctors. If you have one, go find another one. Good ones are out there. And if we patronize them instead of the bad ones, we'll put the bad ones out of business. You know? Right, right. Thank you. I have a sweet tooth, and plus my cravings kick in usually in the evening. I mean, the dog and I can hear a paper bag rustle or a package open miles. You know, if my husband's uh -huh. down there, you know, opens up something, I, I can hear it. What was that? Food? Okay. What's he eating? Uh, you know, so I, my cravings are in the evenings. What Do you have any suggestions or tips or tricks? Yeah, I'll tell you the things that work, all right? So the first thing is, when I started doing this, people told me that my cravings for sweet things would go away. I've been doing this 20, I've been eating this way for 23 years, they haven't gone away at all. Okay, right? so that's right? not going to happen. 
Hey, so we have the sweet taste for a reason, because humans are supposed to eat fruit. And so I always have fruit in my house. I always have my house full of fruit. And I have different fruits for different reasons, okay? So um, pears and apples are, and bananas are filling. But when I have that really sweet tooth, mm -hmm. pineapple and dates are really good for that. I mean, two dates, and that's like having candy bar for me, okay? Um, and so I always have those there. And as long as I have fruit in the house, my sweet tooth is fine, and I don't, I don't go looking for other stuff. Here's another thing you got to do. You have to you have to make the environment supportive of what you're trying to do here. Um, and many people play willpower games with themselves. And here's the deal: willpower has nothing to do with success. And this has been proven in lots of um, research studies on the science of change, which is very well researched. That whether you're trying to change your eating habits or um, a, a, a work habit that could end your career. The thing that works the best is to create an environment that supports your success. So here's what I mean by this. I teach at night. Like tonight, I teach until 11 o'clock, okay? And I have a sweet tooth. And at 11 o'clock after an 18-hour day, it's a little bit tired. That's when your weakness you know, just yeah. kind of kicks in. Yeah. So all I have in my house, if I want something sweet, I've got dates, bananas right now. I've got strawberries, blackberries. Um, I've got some pears and apples. And I think I have half a can of That's it. There's no soy ice cream, there's no cookies, there's no chocolate. So at 11 o'clock at night when I'm hungry and tired and my resistance is down quite a bit, I don't stand in the kitchen playing more power games with myself. And I'm also probably not going to get dressed, get in the car, go to a grocery store. I'm making it harder to do the wrong thing. Now, if night after night after night I finish teaching and I go out to the kitchen and I'm trying to choose between bananas and chocolate, and blackberries and cookies. We know who's going to win. Apples, you know, we know, we know it's going to win. And so, um, and, and I, I, I think we're all the same in that regard. Well, actually, we're not all the same. I know two people who can have chocolate in the house and they don't eat it. My sister is one of them, and my friend Kathy, and I don't understand them at all. And there are no. times I don't even want to be their friend. But I'm serious. My friend Kathy buys a pound of chocolate, puts it up in the bedroom closet, and eats a piece every two or three weeks, and it lasts no. for a year and a half. No. I don't get that. No, no. Not gonna if happen. I had chocolate at my house, I'd end this interview, go home and get it. I only live a mile away, so right. I could take a short break and be back here in no time. Right, <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So make the environment work for you. That's the point I'm making. All right, thank you. Yes, it's true, because, yeah, chocolate, no, it calls, it knows my name. Mm -hmm. name. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. We're um, connecting on Facebook, and we're doing it, we're posting our pictures of what we're eating, um, so that's kind of the public side of it. But on the private side, we're starting, we're doing a chat at night or sometimes during the day, like somebody reached out and said, hey, I'm at the grocery store. Is this okay? Or, you know, at nighttime, we usually try and get together around nine o'clock and say, how was your day? Was there anything that derailed you? And why is this so important to have like a support group like this? Well, I think the biggest reason why people need support is because most of us, I think all of us, and I include myself in this, we live in a world of people who don't do this. And yes. we interact in environments that aren't supportive. Like, I can I can make sure my office, where I'm talking to you now, my house, sanitized. There's nothing in this building I can't eat, and there's nothing at home that, that I can't eat and stay compliant. Um, but then I have to go other places. Right. I, I am in the grocery store. I am in a shopping mall. I am eating at somebody else's house or restaurant. So, And then, in addition to the environment being a little hostile sometimes, most of my friends and family don't do this. My father is the only person in my family who eats this diet. All the rest of them are eating right. fried chicken and french fries and the whole nine yards. And my friends, same thing. I have a few friends that eat this way. Most of my friends don't. I don't want to stop seeing my family and stop seeing my friends. So. Right. I've often said if I didn't work at Wellness Warm Health, I would have to be a member at Wellness Warm Health so that I would have a place to go right. where I get that anchor, you know. So it's like getting the inoculation. Now you can go out into the world. Like tomorrow night I'm going to a dinner uh, that I do every month with friends. I'm the only person who eats well. And so here I get the inoculation. Then I can go spend two hours in the restaurant with my friends and keep myself on track. And then I can go back home where it's safe again, you know. Well, I mean, that's one of the things. I mean, the first Friday of every month, I'm, I dread it. I absolutely dread it. Because our parents, a nice thing, they bring in and spread out in our faculty room a buffet of food for us. 
Yeah. And there's not, I mean, they may have some token fruit, but it, there's nothing I can eat. It's mm-hmm. just oh, nothing. And I just sit there and I go by it and I have to go into the room to get to go to the copier. I have to go to the desk, you know, to sit there between periods when I'm not teaching. So I'm sitting there and I'm smelling this. I'm seeing this. People are going in slathering the cream cheese on the bagels and the, you know, oh my God. And I'm just like, I, ha- I have to get out of the room. I have to get out of the room. I, it's just, you know, and fortunately I bring my food with me, but it's tough. It is tough when it's in... I can keep my ha- my house sanitized. You're right, totally. But having that there in my path, it's just it's one of the toughest things for me. It really yeah. is. And so you have to have you have to have support, and you have to have reinforcement. I, I tell members here, at least once a month, you should try to participate in some educational activity here. And, the, and whether you live in Iceland, because you have members in 35 countries, or you live in Columbus, you, know, you should try to participate. And, and, and for a lot of people. They're going to keep being accountants or architects or whatever. It, it, this isn't going to be what they do for a career. But the reason why I tell people to do that is just so you keep your head in the game. You keep right. reminding yourself why you're exactly. doing it. Because all the other cues out there that we get are, right. are not right and don't support our habits. So, yeah, what you're doing with the support is great. Well, thank you. I'm trying every, every little bit. Um, can you talk a little bit about the pleasure trap? Because I know I hit it, and it's and it's big. And what can we do to avoid it? I think sanitizing the environment, and then the, the one of the messages of the pleasure trap, I think, is to understand that if you have difficulty doing this, it's not a character defect. You know, human beings are hardwired to feel reward when we eat calorie dense foods because we have lived most of our time on the planet with scarcity. And so I, I teach a, a 24 uh, lecture class um, on obesity, and uh, we cover a lot of ground. But, but one of the main concepts of the course is that humans are maladapted to live in the environment we're living in now. And so um, an understanding of that, it doesn't, make it, it doesn't make the cravings go away. It doesn't make the fact that fat feels yummy and tastes oh, good. Oh yeah, I love all that. I love avocados like everybody else, but a cup of avocado has 21 grams of fat, and I can be a 300-pound vegan as much as I can be a 125-pound vegan, right? So, right. Um, but, but you start to understand why. Why is it that I love avocado when I eat it? It's because my ancestors wandered the earth looking for food, and there often wasn't enough of it. And by gosh, you had to feel a lot of reward and chow down on avocados and nuts when you got them because you didn't know when the next meal was coming from. Well, that's not the way I live. I can walk to the grocery store from my house if I have 10 extra minutes and it's open 24 hours a day. There's no scarcity here, right? Right. So I think the pleasure trap does a good job of helping people understand why. It's not, it's, and it goes back to the willpower thing. People think that willpower is the key. Willpower is not going to overcome the fact that all of the, um, uh, all of the pleasure chemicals get released in the brain as soon as you put the first slice of avocado or brownies in your mouth. Right. Yeah, it's true. Wow. Thank you. Um, I had let some of the people know in my group that I was going to be connecting with you today. One of them has um, fibromyalgia and symptoms of that. Is there anything like t- food that they could include or take away that could help with those symptoms? Well, you bring up a couple good points. The first thing is that um, we grow up thinking like reductions. Okay, so pick up a, a magazine that deals with health next right. time you're standing in line at the grocery store. Right. And what you see is this type of stuff. Blueberries reduce the risk of cancer, and strawberries will make you skinny, and if you eat celery, it's good. Okay, so people buy some extra celery and some extra blueberries, and next week it's tofu, right? And so all of this, eat some of this and right. eat some of that, right. and, and I get these emails from people, what kind of food should I eat to bring my iron up? And, and I answer back, plants, and I'm not trying to be a smart app about it. <laughs> uh, it's that this, this battle, if you want to call it that, isn't one by changing a food or a food group, okay? It's, it's one by looking at the overall dietary pattern. And here's how I explain it to people. Diet is like a combination lock. So let's picture, using an analogy, that you have a safe in the wall of your bedroom, and there are $10,000 in the safe, and there's a combination lock on the front. You have to dial four numbers to open it up. If you dial up three, you don't get $7,500. So this is an all-or-nothing game. 
you're going to either get that fourth number right, or you don't get any money at all. And so that's the way it is here. And I'm not proposing dietary perfection because, by the way, I do let myself eat dessert sometimes. Um, I do let myself have chocolate. I am not a teetotaler. I have the occasional glass of wine. But I do those things under very specific circumstances. And we can come back to that if you like. But the point is that on a day like today, it's Wednesday, normal day, got up at 5, teach until 11, you know, the whole nine years, I'm eating food. All right. So, and I got to get the whole thing right. I got I to gotta make sure it's low-fat, high-fiber, densely nutritious foods. Food is medicine, okay? And um, and so that's the way you're going to begin to eat your way out of these health issues is to pay attention to the totality of your diet instead of looking for magical foods and nutrients. And so fibromyalgia, it's just another food more illness. In fact, Dr. Russellson said one time, maybe there's just one disease. It's called bad eating. And then different people have different symptoms. So this person has fibromyalgia, here's a person with rheumatoid arthritis, here's a person who has a heart attack, or here's a person who gets breast cancer. Uh, it's all the same thing, okay? And, and the same habits that you reverse those habits that got you there, you can start to work your way out. So, well, that was, you kind of answered my next question because somebody was asking, they have arthritis and the pain of arthritis. Um, they were thinking maybe they should do like a reduction diet or... Um, I never start with that. No? I never start with that. And, and here's the reason why. Here, the, the rule I follow here from a practice standpoint is I never recommend anything more than what's needed to get the job done. Because every level of restriction that you impose is a barrier to success. Okay? So I've seen people with great intentions who've said, you know, the cup of coffee's going to kill you, and if you eat a cookie, it's going to kill you, and if you have a piece of toast, that's the slippery slope back to the... <laughs> and, and at a certain right. point in time, this almost becomes a little bit silly, and it also becomes unsustainable. You know, we get people in here who are 35 years old, we wanted to do this for the next 60 years, you right. know, so, so you have to be reasonable about it. Um, but um, having, having said that... Um, Again, you got to get this this dietary pattern right in order to uh, in order to move forward and eat your way out of your conditions. So, a person who has arthritis, for example, we start with let's adopt the dietary pattern that we know works for most people. All right. If we don't get rid of all the pain, then let's do an elimination diet. And at that point in time, you're going to be better, most likely. And you're going to be pretty committed to an elimination diet, which takes a few months, by the way. This isn't one of those things that you do for a couple weeks. It takes three weeks on a very limited diet mm -hmm. to get to the place where, in this case, you're pain-free. Okay, now you know it's a food trigger. Now you've got to start introducing one food at a time to test which ones or one you react to. Right. So nothing the matter with that if you've got to do it, but you certainly don't want to propose that to somebody unless they really have to do it. Right. Thank you. Um, can you share any other ideas, tips, tricks that could helpfully help us to continue this way after we do the 10-day? Any yeah, ideas? I will. I, I made a video called A Tour of Dr. Pam's Kitchen, I put, which I put on our member site. Here's why I did this. You mentioned in your introduction that one of my business partners is Chef Dell. And so we are a tiny bit spoiled with the food here because yes. he's always writing a cookbook. Oh and, and here's one of the things we have to do here at Wellness One Health. It's a tough life. We agree to be recipe tasters. Okay, so <laughs> they take all this experimental food, and then because we're good friends, we have to try it. You know, it's just one of those things on the job description. Okay, I'll eat new gourmet food. Uh. So, so having said that, however, one of the misperceptions, I think, that a lot of people have about me is that I sit back in my office and six times a day somebody brings over a white tablecloth and then there's some type of gourmet <laughs> experience. As busy as this place is, half the time if I go walking toward the kitchen, people go, get out of here, we're on a deadline. Move. You know? right. So, right. so that's not the way my life is at all. Yeah, I often leave here at 6 o'clock and I go home. I have an hour to play with the cat, open the mail, make dinner, get back on the phone, you know, so... How do I do that? Well, a couple of things I've learned that really work well. First thing is, um, over the weekend when I'm in town, and when I'm at my Port Clinton house in the summer, I do it up there. Mm -hmm. um, but I go to the farmer's market, and I go to the grocery store. I get all my stuff, and I figure out what I'm going to eat for the week. And some of it's pretty repetitious. I do a smoothie in the morning that has a lot of stuff in it, and then I eat great big salads. Like, think about salad for six, only I eat it all, you know. And then what I'll do on Sunday, usually, 
to take a couple hours and I do some batch type stuff. So I might make a big pot of soup. Um, it varies. What I make changes. Um, I always bake a couple cookie sheets of potatoes, potato chunks. And then I put them in a, uh, and then I'll bake a sheet of uh, beets and then maybe two cookie sheets of Brussels sprouts, something like that. Um, and then I buy, you know, rice and all that sort of thing. And so when the week starts, because Monday morning, the insanity starts, and it, it, it gets a little bit better by Thursday afternoon, and then, right. you know, I work on the weekends and everything, but it's just not quite so crazy. Okay, so on Monday morning, I get up, I make my smoothie and my toast and the whole nine yards, and then for lunch and dinner, and at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when I'm hungry and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff, I'm eating from all that stuff I made in advance. So, I, you know, if I had to make something at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I don't have time to do that. I don't have time to do it tonight at 6. Again, I'm going to leave here a little bit before 6. I've got an hour before it's time to get on the phone. So if I have things already done and all I have to do is warm it, all I'm doing is taking the greens out of the fridge, slice up some mushrooms, and, you know, that kind of stuff. This is easy to do, and in 10 minutes I can put dinner or meals of any type on the table and I'm less likely to get into mischief going out and get some getting something that's prepared. Plus it saves a ton of money. I mean my grocery bill is probably seventy percent of what anybody else's grocery bill is who eats well uh, but doesn't eat this style of of food. So that's what eating all the food, the cheese, all these all the animal products, the oils Yeah. yeah. And all that packaged stuff. So so that's what I do. So, you know, when I go home tonight, um, I'm going to have a great big salad. I'm going to take some sweet potato chunks out of the fridge and, you know, put them in the microwave. And, um, you know, two or three sweet potatoes worth of potato chunks and a big salad. That's dinner. It's delicious. Um, I also have, if I decide I don't want to eat sweet potatoes, I've got Brussels sprouts baked. I've got beets. I've got, um, uh, and I have a big pot of brown rice vegetable soup with uh, baby kale and uh, baby bell mushrooms. And, you know, a couple bowls of that with a big salad. So I have plenty of things to choose from without having to do anything except um, just warm it up. And Bell always says, when I talk about cooking, he goes, Hammy, don't tell people you cook. You don't cook, sweetheart. He says, you just warm things. I said, okay, well, I promise I won't tell anybody that that's cooking. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much. I can't say thank you enough, I mean, for your time, your insights. And I love your analogies and I love your stories. In the classes that I've taken from you, I've you know the the things that you've shared with me, it's like oh that's great you know and I, you know, <laughs> okay. you know I'm like it's laughing my on the other you're, end. You're a good interviewer. You no. should do more of this kind of thing. Well, I'm working on it, so I'm trying, <laughs> trying. I want to inspire people to uh, to continue this way of life. So yeah, well, it's a fabulous way of life. You know what's really fun yes. at this age to not be sick. No, you know, right. And, right. and it's so much less stressful. You know, I, I talked to a guy a few days ago. He was diabetic. And his copay, listen to this, his copay for drugs, 400 bucks a month. That is a huge amount of money. Now, I don't care how much money somebody has. $400 a month is a lot of money. If you started taking it away from me right now, oh my gosh. it would hurt me. Okay? So think about the freedom from all that and, um, and just feeling great. Um, I love that part of it. I've always said I found what I want to do for a living. I love what I do here. I love this career. But the best gift of all is that I found health for myself. Right. Right. There's, if you have your health, you have everything. That's you exactly. You can figure out anything else if right. you have your health. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you.